Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. Today, Scott sits down with Sonia Outlaw Clark, who works at the West Tennessee Delta and Heritage Museum in Brownsville, Tennessee. You might also know it as the Tina Turner Museum. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, spirit, accomplishments, and the heritage of our beautiful home here in West Tennessee. Um, As executive director of the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, Sonia wears many hats and she wears them all extremely well. She's a writer, a designer, a museum curator, a champion of West Tennessee tourism, a music promoter, an events coordinator. I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to waste a minute of our time with Sonia Outlaw Clark today. Welcome, Sonia. Well, thank you, Scott, for having me. I'm not sure I can live up to all of that introduction. (laughs) Oh, I have no doubt that you can. So tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, center and what it is. It's it's kind of a welcome center, but it's it's like a welcome center on steroids. Um, Tell us a little bit about about that. Okay. Well, originally, yes, it started out as a tourist information center, uh, just kind of a um, stopping off point off of I-40 because Brownsville is really close to I-40. Exit 56. Exit 56. Uh, It was going to be kind of a staging area for people to come off, get information about the West Tennessee area, try to get them off of the interstate and onto the back back roads and enjoying our culture. Uh, and what's unique about West Tennessee. Uh, Since then, that was 20 years ago. Since then, we've kind of grown to a music heritage destination. Uh, So not only are we still uh, serving as a welcome center and tourist information, but we're also presenting history on the ag of the area. We have the West Tennessee Cotton Museum. We talk about our great West Tennessee musicians. We talk about the Hatchie River, which is a wonderful natural resource in West Tennessee. And then we also have the last home of bluesman Sleepy John Estes, a blues pioneer from Brownsville, Tennessee. And, of course, our um, probably most famous citizen is Anna Mae Bullock, who most people know as Tina Turner. So we have her childhood school which is now the Tina Turner Museum on property. So you're right. We do a little bit of everything. I mean, just in just in that introduction, you gave me about four hours worth of podcast material. So um, we're going we're gonna to dive into some of that. Um, how did you end up with this job that you're so good at? What was the path? You obviously love what you do. You do a great job at it. How did you end up where you are today? Well, that's a good question. I'm not really sure how I ended up there, uh, but I sure am glad that I did, and I love what I do. Um, I was a cosmetologist for about 16 years. I did a lot of community volunteerism, was involved in a lot of groups and things in town. Uh, At one point, I started when the computer started getting really popular and everybody was starting to get computers. I did an online computer course and learned how to do the computer. Uh, got into graphic design. I had always kind of painted and dabbled uh, with art stuff, but I kind of dove into graphic design, started doing a lot of graphic design work for different organizations and stuff around town. Uh, Then I got recruited by the local newspaper to come be on their production team, did that for a while. And, you know, the Heritage Center... Uh, When it began, it was a great project, was always interested in what was going on out there. Uh, Ten years ago, the executive director there um, chose to retire, 
And I just saw it as a great opportunity to continue what I was doing because I loved working for the community and promoting West Tennessee. I love West Tennessee. And, you know, all of us working together has made such a difference in the area. Well, and, and I didn't, you know, know about it as a kid, but, you know, being from Memphis and driving to Brownsville to my grandparents' house frequently, we would pass right by where the center is today. My grandfather used to always take me to Dairy Queen after church um, on Sundays because he loved Dairy Queen. Right? He loved that Dairy Queen right there by the center. That um, was the Sunday thing to do was to go to Dairy Queen. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, all, everybody was there. Or McDonald's. I know there, McDonald's was always really popular. Well, see, there. I remember when McDonald's wasn't there. Oh, wow. So it was yeah. just Dairy Queen. Everyone went out to the Dairy Queen on Sunday. So it would have been really easy for you just to become the executive director there and just sort of, you know, have it be a welcome center, put out brochures. And what what made you think, you know what, maybe there's an opportunity here for this to be something more than just a welcome center? You know, I'm not sure when I decided that or when I thought that. But, you know, you couldn't help but see the potential. You couldn't help but the people coming off of the interstate, you were meeting people from all over the world. And just last year, we had people come from 51 different countries, all 50 states. You you felt like there was, as a local, I knew there was so much more that we weren't showing them and we weren't telling them. So that opportunity just, it never occurred to me not to do more. What was the, what was the first step? What was the first section that you sort of took a little further than what it was. I guess I jumped on the music theme. Uh, we had had a blues festival in Brownsville for about 10 years, and it had, it had kind of gone away, and it had been gone for several years. And I just thought, you know, I've got Sleepy John's home sitting here. He was one of the pioneers in the industry, in the blues industry. He was rediscovered in the 60s. He traveled all over the world. He was better known in Europe than he was in Brownsville. So I thought, you know, that was a perfect opportunity, and I had the location to bring a blues festival back. So the first, the first year I um, hosted the Exit 56 Blues Fest, and we've been growing ever since. Right. It's actually become quite well known. People come from all over the world to attend and to hear blues. You've got the great, um, you've got the great setting to be able to do it on, on his front porch. Um, so he was from Brownsville, Haywood County. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, you know, the history books say he was born in Ripley. Uh, he actually, he was in Lauderdale County, but he was in the Nutbush, Durhamville area. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he moved to Brownsville as a young man, um, worked in the fields, didn't like that, uh, picked up the guitar, kind of self-taught himself guitar, uh, his first guitar was a cigar box guitar that he made himself. Uh, his mother bought him a store-bought one as a reward for picking cotton one day. You know, it's like, if you'll just go pick cotton, you know, I'll buy you a guitar. Um, and what's really unique about Sleepy John is that his music tells the story. Uh, all of his songs were about his life and what was happening, uh, you know, from Rats in My Kitchen Uh, which everybody in the country has experienced at some point or another, uh, to um, Diving Duck Blues, just how um, sad and blue, literally blue, that you can get. Uh, The song goes, if whiskey was a river and I was a diving duck, I'd dive down to the bottom and never come up. Uh, Just, you know, that was his escape for the hard life that it was back in those days. And... um, He has influenced all genres of music, you know, from Bob Dylan to Muddy Waters to uh, some of his songs were just remade uh, by Taj Mahal and Keb Moe. Uh, He continues to influence people, and it just seemed really important that, that that we remember that and that we tell the world more about Sleepy John. And so you knew where his the house was that he lived in or, you know, the Actually the city had saved his house before I came into the picture. They had moved it to our local library hmm. uh, and it was just kind of sitting on the grounds and there had been a couple of little concerts on his porch there in town. But when the center was developed it just made sense so more people would see it uh, to be moved out there. That's amazing. So it's not the only house there, though. 
Or the, it is the only house. It's it not is the only, the only house. Yeah, it's there's also a school. There is a sitting school sitting right next to it. So it's not the only building. That's what I should have That's said. That's right. It's not the only building. Um, there's a school right next to it, and I'm fascinated by many aspects of the building that's there, but why don't you start us from the very beginning? Um, how did you first hear about the school and what what did it take to get to where it is today? Which, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and tell the ending. It is an incredible um, world-class exhibit right there at the center that people can see. And you do have people from all over the world who are Tina Turner fans or who are just interested in that who come to check it out. So now back us up and tell us how did that get started? Well, it's a long story, but I'll make it short. We have, a, we have all the time in the world. Luke is not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, it started out with a conversation between me and the owner of the school's wife. It was sitting on a farm in Nutbush. Uh, I was talking to her one day. Pam and Joe Stevens owned it. I was talking to Pam one day, and she said, Sonia, you know you should get the old chalkboard or a desk or something out of that old school before something happens to it and add it to to." your center. Uh, In our music museum, we already had a Tina exhibit, but it was not, you know, it was a nice exhibit, but not huge. Um, Well, that was the first I had heard of that school actually being there. Uh, So uh, a few days after that, I was at a conference with Carol Van West, who is the state historian now, but is the director of the Center for Historic Preservation. And I said, I have an opportunity to get an old desk or chalkboard or something out of Tina's school. And he said to me, you don't want it. And my mouth just flew open because I'm like, here's the state preservationist, the head preservation person telling me I don't want it. And his next sentence was, I've seen that building and you can save the whole building. And, and, you know, to myself, I'm saying, yeah, right, that's going to happen. But I thought that got me thinking and a month or so later, I was with Joe, and I said, what are you going to do with that building? And he said, well, I don't know. Do you want it? And I said, well, I might. And he said, well, I really don't know what I'm going to do with it. And so we just kind of left it at that. That was like in November of 2011. By March of 2012, he came to me and said, do you still want that building? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he said, well, we've got to May to get it out of the field or it's going to be torn down. And I was like, What? He, uh, the farmer was putting in an irrigation system, the people that farmed his farm, and uh, so they wanted it out of there. So we got on the ball, we talked to the city council, they agreed they would move the building for us if we could come up with a plan to restore it. And that's what we did. The school, we didn't make the May deadline, but the school uh, made it to the Heritage Center on June 1st of 2012. Well, how, how, how did you even, how did you know where to start? If somebody told me to make a plan, how, how did you, did you Google make a plan for a historic building? I, you know, that happened so fast, I don't remember what I did. You know, I, I got, I know I got with my board and I said, how are we going to make this happen? Uh, luckily, the mayor was really excited about being able to save it. So she was on our side. The alderman got excited. Uh, We said, you know, we we said our plan is if you will move it, we will take three years to raise private funds. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to restore it back to original. We're not going to have heating and air. We're going to have it like the original school would have been. It's an 1889 African-American one-room schoolhouse. So that was our plan. Now, our plan, what we have now is nothing like what our plan was then. Uh, Once we got it on site, we got it in the dry, we started restoring it, and we contacted Tina's assistant, her personal assistant. We, one of uh, local people, still had her number. And we said we would like to promote that this is Tina's childhood school. Uh, We would like a quote for a press release. And they came back and they said, sure, you know, education is really important to Tina and that you're saving her school means a lot. Uh, So we were able to release a press release that Tina was supporting the project. That allowed us to talk to the fans all over the world and say, can you help us with this project? And so the fact that it was a schoolhouse meant a lot to Tina Turner because she has education is one of the things that she thinks is important. In fact, she actually did a little interview. We're going to play a little clip of the interview of Tina talking um, about the importance of education. Everyone has a dream, I think. Uh, 
but I have to say that your dream cannot work without education. I think I stand for an example for poor children, um, for their future, to, sh to show them that it is possible. If you just go straight ahead, stay on course, you can achieve success with determination of hard times, not letting it stop you. I hope that as people walk through the school, they see that I set an example for a hometown girl that grew up in hard times that made a good life for herself and follow my example. I'm very proud that it's there. I hope that people will leave taking the importance of education. So um, obviously she supported the, um, the initiative of getting the schoolhouse in. At what point did it go from just being a schoolhouse to being a full-blown Tina Turner exhibit like it is today? About halfway through the project, her assistant called, uh, her name was Rhonda, and she said, Tina's really excited about what y'all are doing and she would like to contribute. Um, she would like to send costumes from her last concert, gold records, some of her collection to be in, in the school. And everything changed then. I bet. So, so someone calls, I mean, you hadn't been in the museum business, quote unquote, you, you do a great job, but all of a sudden you're given this great opportunity. How do you tackle that? What's the, how, and the money you need financing to get it all done. And, um, cause I can look at it and tell it's so state of the art. It's so well done. You know, if some money was spent to make it look that good. Money was spent. And fortunately, Tina knew what it was going to take. She sent her designer, she sent an architect, she, she, we were all worked together in the design process. Uh, Stephen Seals Associates from New York came once the, uh, all the building was completed. He came, he put the exhibit together for us. I wish I could claim credit for doing that, but I can't. I mean, really what you've done the whole time there is you bite off more than you can chew and then you start chewing. So, you know, that's really... Hope uh, that I can swallow at some point. <laughs> that's, that's, it's really um, impressive. And you've really put that center on the map. Um, one part of what you do that's, that's really interesting to me because it's something that a lot of people in the rest of the world don't know a lot about, and that's cotton. So tell us a little bit about the Cotton Museum that you have there and, and what is the role of cotton in Haywood County? Well, we have, we're home to the West Tennessee Cotton Museum. The role of cotton in Haywood County is that Haywood County is the largest cotton-producing county in the state of Tennessee. Uh, agriculture is still the number one industry in Haywood County, as it is in the state. Um, but it's, it's what the basis of our county was built on. Uh, we talk about the ginning process. We talk about um, how bales of cotton are made, uh, everything from the field to the fabric. We have uh, a lot of the primitive implements, uh, the mule-drawn plows and things like that for people to look at. Uh, in the center of our cotton museum right now, we have a gin exhibit that is a 1 16th scale replica of an actual 1960s gin that a local West Tennessee man, Daryl Cox, made um, that really tells the story of the ginning process. We're able to use that replica to tell people what cotton goes through once it leaves the field and comes for the ginning process. And a lot of people out there probably listening have not even seen cotton growing in a field. So the ginning, pro all of right. that is completely um, foreign to most people. And you get, how many people do you get stopping by the center um, each year? We get 30 plus thousand people a year. So see, that's fascinating. You're, you're really introducing a lot of those people to cotton and how cotton goes from being planted in the ground to being on the clothes that we wear. Right. And, you know, it was that was one of the most amazing things to me when I first took the job was people's perception of cotton because I grew up with it. You right. know, I, I grew think up on I, a farm. My, my father and mother picked cotton. Right. And I think yours, our, our dads went to school together. And, you know, I'm assuming your family did, too. But, right. you know, they, they 
absolutely speak of the horrors of it all the time. Apparently, picking cotton is something that none of us, you know, could really understand the way that hand picking it would tear your hands up and, and how exhausting and hot you have to pick cotton in, in the worst time of the year. And so, you know, obviously, you know, cotton also speaks to a lot of cultural issues, including slavery and, and race relations and, uh, you know, uh, sharecropping, you know, cotton is just a topic that is just rife with all types of topics that can be explored and discussed. And, you know, a lot of people don't, don't realize you know, what, what all that entails. Right. And we try to keep actual cotton stalks in the museum so people can feel it. We're not a hands off, uh, museum, especially in the cotton museum. Um, you know, I want people to put their hand around that bowl and feel the stick. Right. And know what it feels like to have to grab that and pull it Yeah, and why hands were bleeding and, and all the calluses and what that came from. I actually had a great grandfather who went about it a smarter way. He didn't make a lot of money, but he went down the road and picked up the cotton off the ground that had fallen out of the trucks as they were taking it to the gin. So yeah, that was probably a you probably didn't get as much that way. But, no, you, know, you didn't get but your you hands messed up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So tell me a little bit more about your blues festival that you have um, every year. I know you've got one coming up. It's uh, what, what kind of artists do you get? And, and, and then also talk about some of the musicians that just come through. You've become a famous place for people who are from all over the world who just want to come in and find a place. They sit next to the fireplace you have there and just, you know, play the guitar. So tell us about that. Well, we, um, our blues fest is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we're a two day blues fest, uh, Saturday. Uh, is all day on Sunday is usually our women in blues showcase. So, you know, blues isn't just the men. There's, there's lots of women in that industry as well. We, you know, we, we say we're the home of the country blues because that's the genre of blues that Sleepy John and Hammy Nixon and Yank Rachel and all the Brownsville bluesmen, uh, tended to play. Uh, but for our festival, we know that there are people who don't just like the country blues. So we also do the hill country blues, the delta blues, the rhythm and blues. So we, you know, if you come to our Exit 56 Blues Fest, don't expect just to hear the old country blues. You'll hear there'll be some entertainers that you will enjoy. And we do. We, we try to showcase the region. Uh, so you may, you know, we may not have a huge big name that you know from Chicago or somewhere like that, but we have phenomenal regional entertainers in this area who are well known in the blues industry, and we try to focus on those people. Music is is obviously really important to you and to the center. I just I know that I see on Facebook now because I follow you all. I see people from all over the world who are coming in there for, you know every single day it seems like there's somebody else you're putting on there how, how did how did that start it well it started as uh we're partners with the americana music triangle and aubrey preston who was the founder of that uh one of his big things that he likes is for places to have a picking corner well, he donated a few guitars to us and since then we've uh, acquired like a drum set and some other things but just to allow people to walk in the door and sit down and play a guitar and just experience their music or to be able for them to make music in a place that has such rich music history. Uh, and yeah, every day we have someone come in who can play the guitar or the drums or, and we love our impromptu concerts from people coming through. And sometimes people coming through are pretty well known. Uh, Artist. Yeah, you know, music is really important to us here at Discovery Park of America as well, but we don't have a picking corner. So I have a feeling we're gonna um we're gonna steal that idea because that's that's really, you know, we have cabins. What a great place for people to sit up on the cabins and play some blues and yes. you know. So yeah, no, great idea. Thank you so much for uh being here at Discovery Park um and talking to us a little bit. Um, if you're headed down I-40 between Jackson and Memphis, pull off at uh, exit 56 and check out the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center. And for more information, you can visit westtennesseeheritage.com. Follow them on Facebook, um, and you'll be able to see all these um, people playing from all over the world. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Scott. I've enjoyed this. This was fun. You are welcome. So Mr. Webster defines the word discovery as meaning the action or process of discovering or being discovered. Well, Andrew Gibson, 
and the others on the education team at Discovery Park of America lead the process of discovery every single day at our 100,000 square foot museum and 50 acre heritage park in Union City, Tennessee. And now here he is to lead us in a little journey of discovery today. All right. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Jeff Davis, who is one of our car specialists here at the park. Um, And he'll be talking more about the transportation gallery here, uh, one of our largest galleries we have on display here at Discovery Park of America. Uh, So, Jeff, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved uh, with, with the park? Well, I lived here most of my life here in Union City, and I was in the body shop business. And Mr. Robert Kirkland, being a good friend of mine, he called my next his next-door neighbor, not mine, but he called his next-door neighbor, and he said, I need to put up some committees together on people that know something about cars. So I was one of them guys that he got together with, and... He put a committee together, and some guys went out in Las Vegas, and they bought most of the cars. And to tell you the, what's going on in the museum right now, we have 17 cars that belong to the museum, and we have eight cars that's on loan to us. We didn't have any cars on loan when we opened the museum, but we constantly are having people come in, and they're saying, hey, I've got this, and I've got that. I'd love to have that in here. And we've picked up some nice cars doing that. So, you know, over the, the course of the years, we picked up a lot of, a lot of nice cars. Um, certainly, you, ha- you must have a favorite or two or three. Or I do. The 1957 Thunderbird is my favorite. I fell in love with that car when it came in here. I mean, it is absolutely a new car. Most of the cars we have are, have been restored back to concourse-type points and everything, and they are the best of the best. And this 57 Thunderbird was done by Menards out of Dallas, Texas. And they are the premier Thunderbird restoration people. And to give you a little history about the Thunderbirds, the Thunderbirds came out in 55. They was only introduced in 55 because in 1953, Chevrolet came out with a Corvette. So we have to get in competition. So Ford says, hey, we've got to have a two-seat sports car ourselves. So they introduced the Thunderbird. Well, when the Thunderbird hit the market, it was a V8 car, much more high performance, much more streamlined, and more luxury. And it is a hard top car, but the top comes off. And that gets a lot of people's attention because when they walk into the museum, they say, I'll explain to them, I'll say, hey, come over here and look at this Thunderbird convertible. And they'll look at it and they go, hey, that's not, a, that's not a convertible. That's got the top on it. And I said, no, the top comes off. So it is a convertible car, and it is a two-seat, and they are just some of the most sporty cars that were ever introduced. The one we have in the museum is a bronze color. This was a special color that you could only get if you special ordered the car. You couldn't go to a dealership and find one sitting on the lot. You had to special order this color, and there's not many of them out there, so that makes ours even rarer there. And then uh, do you have a, another favorite, uh, you know, or is that just the only one? Oh, no. We have some. It, our, probably our most expensive car that we have in the museum is our 29 Lincoln. And the 29 Lincoln in its day was probably one of the most expensive cars in 1929. It was a $4,050 car. And in 1929, for that price, you could have bought 10 Model A's, which were the same year model. So you was a very rich person to own a 29 Lincoln. They only made 150 of them. So the one we have, probably in this day and time, we probably don't have over 25 in the the country. And one of the stories behind our car is they bought it at at, uh, Meekum Auction is where the car was bought. And they bought the car, and it's got a little notoriety to it. When the man sold the car to us. He says, well, I hate to say this, but I've lost a lot of money. He says, so he was asked, why did you lose a lot of money? We have approximately $300,000 in the car. He said, I've got $500,000 in restoring it. In 2008, they had the National Lincoln Car Show. This was the best of the show at the Lincoln Car Show. 
So basically, we have the best Lincoln that was ever made. So one of my favorite things about the Transportation Gallery, um, as patrons walk through, you get to hear stories of people enjoying those cars when they were younger. Do you have any personal connections with some of those those cars out there that we have on display here? Well, there's a 57 Chevrolet convertible that everybody that comes in the museum, that's the first car they gravitate to. They'll go to this car and they'll say, man, my daddy had one of them. My cousin had one of them. My uncle had one of them. Everybody had one of the 57 Chevrolet. So everybody knows what that car is. Well, I have a story to my own. My first car was 57 Chevrolet. And this day, when you tell somebody that you bought your first car for $250, they look at you like you're crazy. Well, I gave $250 for my first car. The guy was wanting $500 for it. I kept on after, after him. He kept getting tired of seeing me come around. And he says, I'm going to sell you that car. And it was a good car. It was a, it looked like new. I bought it in 1963. One of the other cars we have in the museum is a 1938 Cadillac. This car was owned by W.C. Fields, the actor from the 30s and 40s. And not only was he an actor, he was the actor. So we've had people probably in this car like Mae West, Jack Benny, different people like that have probably rode in this car. It's a one-owner car, it's in immaculate condition, and if you see the car, you're going to say to yourself, how do you ride around in a 1938 Chevrolet without any air conditioning? The car is black, and you did not have air conditioning in 1938. So he had one of the nicest cars, limousines, what it is, one of the nicest cars you could sit down in, but it had no air conditioning. So you had to imagine that they probably rode around mostly in this car at nighttime. One, things I, one of the things I want everybody to know is, is August 31st here at Discovery Park, we're going to have a car cruise in. And I want to start this off early by telling everybody we're going to have this and get prepared for it. It's going to free, be a free day for the car participants. All they've got to do is come to the park. We're going to give them two tickets to the park. We're going to give them door prizes, goodie bags, and they'll have a chance to win a set of tires. Well, I certainly appreciate you coming on. I've certainly learned something, and I hope our listeners have too. Uh, for those of you who get to make it out to Discovery Park, and we certainly hope you get to, uh, find Jeff and find some of our other docents working in the Transportation Gallery and share your stories about some of those classic cars. We love hearing those. Uh, we hope to see you here soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.